Hello everyone and welcome back to Around the World in 8 Planes, this time in Microsoft Flight Sim 2020. And I am in the Alpha Jet by Blue Mesh. It was freeware. I think it was a demo version that was freeware and posted to FlightSim.to. However, uh, I did not see a link for it when I went to FlightSim.to to get a link so that I could post it in the video description. So I don't know, maybe they're turning it into a payware plane now because it was fairly high quality. I think it was sort of like a demo that they posted as freeware. So uh, taking a look outside, you can see it looks quite nice. So there's the Dassault Dornier uh, Alpha Jet and we are flying from Fortaleza to Recife. I don't actually know how to pronounce that, R-E-C-I-F-E. So I'm probably pronouncing it wrong there. But uh, relatively short flight in Brazil should take about an hour, but we'll see, maybe a little bit longer than that. And we are continuing to listen to the Apollo 14 audio already in progress. They continue to wonder about their docking situation with the LEM and whether it will be safe to uh, decouple the LEM, go down for a landing and come back. So we are continuing to play that audio. And then I'll let him take it uh, from there. And uh, I am going to take off. Uh, where in this uh, sequence of dockings did you... Uh, actuate the extend release uh, switch position again. Over Interesting fluctuation in the okay, thrust. Okay, after the second attempt. We, uh, it was per your suggestion, the ground suggestion, and hmm. we uh, went through the uh, extend release uh, in through there. No, wait a minute, we tried it ourselves after the second one, didn't we? So, Fortaleza. Last time we were in... Oh, that's fast. Last time we were in X-Plane 11, so let's take a good look around here now. Sorry, the plane is a little bit loud right now, so I'll have to pause and reduce it so that we can hear the Apollo 14 audio. It's already pretty low. Did you ever move the uh, docking probe retract, that is the bottle select switch, off of uh, primary one? That is, did you recycle the switch or do anything in, in this sequence or just leave it in that position once you'd initially selected it? Well, we don't think that we have We do have air brakes. Okay. Roger. Filled it up with fuel. Hopefully we can fly fairly low okay, so we're coming up, and still uh, go fast. The final successful docking here and uh, tell us that you uh, got this one and a half, two degrees pitch up in the coas, but looked pretty good. You applied plus X and held, and uh, I think that's where I broke in. Go ahead. Uh, and okay, and then on the plus X, then that that brought the uh, you know the coas right down. Seems so to have a lot of power. Alignment, uh, then when everything was fine and. Uh, Translation was uh, was real good all the way, except uh, except like I say for that uh, you know small pitch up, degree and a half or whatever it was, uh, right at uh, contact as the uh, as the uh, probe sliding into the drove. Okay, I did. So continuing on from Fortaleza here. Do call dog retract. I went to uh, retract. One. Nice place, but yeah, obviously not photos. I mean, uh, photogrammetry or anything. Okay. 
about a three second time period from the time it went to primary one. So I had the barber pole and approximately a uh, second later after that, the two gray and the hard dog. Okay, stand by. Uh, 14, Houston. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, were you thrusting uh, plus X all the time from uh, initial contact until the time that uh, you got the hard docking over? That's permanent, Bruce. Uh, once I got her in the drogue, uh, you know, we uh, talked among ourselves and uh, we told Al to hold off until I'm thrusting and uh, I'm satisfied with the alignment. So uh, when we made contact and I thrusted and uh, it looked like we were, everything was good and I, I held a positive plus X all the way until we got the, uh, the latches. Okay, now uh, from contact, uh, when you started thrusting plus X, this airspeed like indicator over here off to the side does not seem to jive uh, with the one inside the cockpit the though. The the this is showing 280 knots, that's showing 345. I was wondering because it seemed really powerful. But it would make more sense if the one inside here is correct. What does you know, the uh, no GPS say? But the feeling uh, um, among us here and uh, it says we're in the red zone at 360. There, that, uh, no, I'm very confused. We had capture latch lock until after we went to primary. Now I, you know, I'm sure y'all looked at it. You've got people down there tearing a probe apart, but uh, I don't even know if it's physically possible. But I don't feel that we had any capture latches in that hole until uh, that last operation it's also sort of uh, wiggling right now went to primary and drove the beauty in there you can see the okay, percent rpm wobbling like the, again this was just a early demo i forget which version like, like 0.5 like or something seemed pretty good but after you went to, maybe they're uh, polishing primary. it up or something no no i was watching the uh the limb i was plus x and, and uh I'll call primary and uh, we start closing on it. And uh, there was no movement, uh, no. Uh, I'll try and use an outside app to track the flight and see okay, what we the, what uh, speed we have. Uh, no movement after uh, after you uh, started the the plus X and got yourself seated in there until such time as the model fired. Uh, that is no, no more closing movement, is that correct? Nope. Uh, that, that's affirmative. As far as I can uh, you know, tell, we, uh, we were there. Well, the outside app says we're at 351 knots uh, indicated. Okay, do you read me, Bruce? So I'll throw it down a bit. Okay, and uh, you know, we got, uh, we're got we sitting steady in the drove, plus X. Everything looking fine. We hit the retract switch, and we start moving together. Uh, I didn't hear anything nor see any action until we heard the latches uh, close. Roger, but uh, while you were sitting there, then the, the uh, talk back was gray, and then three seconds after you went to primary, approximately went to barber pole, and the nominal sequence started. Well, I was looking at the talk back. Uh, yeah, that's about the only thing we saw pointed out before, about three seconds after the initiation of the primary contact, uh, the primary retract switch to the one number one position. They went barber pole for perhaps a quarter, half a second, and then they went gray simultaneously with a hard dock. I'm wondering if there's but some sort of de-ice and you know, maybe our speed hey, indicator is ahead, needs some okay, heat or something. That one, now, uh, we if that affects the one in here, I don't know. To, I don't think so, though. We, uh, you know, we Normally it just drops off. And, uh, we felt like we had them all, which uh, we did. But it really felt like the, uh, the latches uh, 
we, we got a couple or, you know, it's hard to say how many, but we got some latches. Pretty I mean, sure it can go 360 knots, though. Something like that. I'll double then check. We got the rest of them in a ripple. So, uh, I think uh, we got the docking latches in two distinct times, separated by, you know, a very small amount, but uh, at least it was enough to say it was not one continuous ripple fire. Okay, Stu, we copy that. Maximum so, speed 540 one knots one at one sea one level. One. So we could probably go faster than this. And the red line on the GPS is probably wrong. Let's see. I'll give it some more juice. It seems to wobble though. What is going on with that? Can you have the right seat? We're coordinated, I think, with the way this happened. I saw it moving in previous attempts. We had. You see, it sort of goes forward, back, forward, back in a weird way. Sort of less annoying in here, but we can see the percent RPM wobble. The actual throttle here isn't wobbling though. See? So it's not the throttle that's doing that. It's not so problematic at lower throttle settings. says with internal fuel it has two and a half hours of endurance at low altitude which we are at but possibly that's a lower throttle setting though in my throttle range I'm at 50 percent it's sort of reading 70 percent on those gauges there Probe head was in fact 
locked into the drogue at that time or not. Well, this seems pretty stable right now anyway. No, I, I guess the uh, answer to that would be we don't know. But now, I, I guess, uh, as you realize, after uh, after I collapsed the, uh, the probe, it, it definitely was. Okay, you say after you uh, collapsed the, the probe, the head of the thing was uh, definitely locked in there. Yeah, it, it was hanging in there, and I had to uh, apply a little tug to uh, to get it out. I went uh, right by the uh, the decal on the checklist, and uh, I think uh, I think you asked at that time about the force that it took to get, to bring it out, and uh, it appeared you know reasonably normal for the first time that I had done it in uh, in zero g. It didn't didn't appear to be uh, anything funny about it. question that we were trying to get out here just now. Apollo 14, this is Houston at uh, GET of 28 hours and 30 minutes. You are approximately 1180 nautical miles. That's 1180 nautical miles away from the S4B. Uh, if you'd care to look for it, uh, we suggest you use a, a P-52 program with a star code of zero and uh, load the, the following numbers in noun 88, if you're ready to copy. Go ahead. Roger, noun 88 values are one minus three one five zero five minus eight seven one eight nine er minus three seven four nine er one. Read back over. Okay, uh, we'll uh, plug in uh, minus 31505, minus 87189er, minus 37491. Roger, read back's correct, and uh, we'll probably at the end of the uh, launch vehicle systems debriefing here uh, have some more numbers for you if you want to, uh, if you don't acquire it on this first pass. And uh, we're ready to press on with the debriefing. Uh, if you've got your flight plan handy, you can just uh, proceed down through the questions and we'll interrupt if we find anything that's unclear. Or if you'd prefer, I can ask them to you in uh, panel discussion type thing and you can answer back over. And hear what they were saying there. The only uh, change in flight level we noticed was during the uh, first part of the launch on this one. The plane we had the initial noise of uh, ignition and the build up in noise during uh, the max Q. And uh, of course, the associated Uh, 14 Houston, I think we're coming up on uh, an antenna switchover point here. You seem to be fading down to the mud. Okay. You mean now 
one of you. Okay, we're reading you better uh, signal strength-wise, Al. We still seem to be getting a little bit of breakup uh, from your comm carrier. Can you uh, reposition the mic, see if that helps any? Okay, I have the mic right in front of my uh, mouth right now. Is that better? Roger. Yeah, I think we better take it from the okay. uh, top again. Okay, from the top. The only significant change in noise level we noticed was that especially to do with the burning of the engines in the atmosphere, that is the ignition, of course, build up with noise there. And uh, the uh, noise level increased through max Q and then a drop off. Uh, other than that, uh, with respect to the noise itself, we had no problems at all in the communication from the time during the stages of the plane. Does that uh, satisfy everybody on question number one? That's affirmative. Press on. Hey, number two. On the F1C, you'll be noticed no significant changes in. Uh, Noise level and vibration. I don't know what we just discussed. Uh, F1C we, we thought uh, was a real fine ride, nothing uh, unexpected. The uh, F2, we noticed a change in the vibration, a sort of slight pogo, which started at 8 plus 4 zero. Uh, nothing uh, really of any great magnitude. And, uh, on S 4 b to orbit burn, we uh, noticed no significant changes in the noise of vibration level. Uh, we noticed nothing unusual on S 4 b during uh, TLI ignition. However, we did notice beginning of a slight hum, low hum, or buzz uh, toward the end of the TLI burn. That's it for number two, but any questions there? Uh, we have no questions right now on that, Al. We're uh, closing our loop down here with uh, the Huntsville Operations Support Center, so it takes us a, a few seconds to a minute or so to get a response back. Why don't you press on with uh, question number three, and if we get any queries, why we'll reopen the previous ones. This is the town of Masoro. Okay, and number three, uh, nothing unexpected. M-O-S-S-O-R-O. Getting some winds here. Good communication about the entire uh, 
Whoa, got, uh, clearing of the throat one there. More right in. Uh, question number 10. And uh, it's based on. Okay, I'll take that one, Bruce. Okay. Okay, Bruce. Uh, that, that came from my comment. And uh, as we were station keeping and watching the binning, uh, it looked to me like the booster had picked up a little right yaw as, uh, as I looked at it. I meant uh, moving left on me. 
There's a dam here. Well, there's a reservoir, obviously. I don't think the dam is properly represented, though. I think it's supposed to be back there. At least that's why I'm interpreting it as on the map. Seems likely. I think the river is called the uh, Rio Piranhas Asu, something like that. That the reservoir is on, I mean. Houston, uh, our belief is that there's no correlation at the present time between your earlier EKG problems and uh, the current uh, degraded calm through Al's calm carrier. Uh, we would like to suggest when you have the chance that uh, Al try using the spare calm carrier and see if that improves communications. Gotta watch those vibrations. Uh, I realize this is sort of hard to put your finger on. Is there any way you can quantify the level? Or we really don't need to acquire the track the level was. that aggressively. Nice hills here. Still going with the fall textures on the Bijan Habashi no, trees. No, I, I think that's pretty tough, Bruce. Uh, well, it should be spring fact, down uh, here, right? You know, the, uh, I guess it's sort of borderline. So We're well close to the equator. So smooth that uh, you know we we had time to uh, to pick it up. I suspect that uh, you know it was it was low enough level that uh, if, if you had something else on your mind, uh, you wouldn't even have noticed it. Uh, did, uh, did this uh, just sort of start abruptly, or did it build up in the background? Do you think? 
We should be headed towards Campina Grande. I'm not sure as the left boat that it was a build up and uh, that seems to be the majority. Yeah, and it just came on kind of slow and came up, uh, stayed at a low level and uh, and was there. Okay, and uh, the only other question we got back in is that at uh, 8 plus 40, this uh, Pogo type uh, thing that you mentioned was uh, could you give us a little more detail on uh, the direction of motion of it, the amplitude, uh, any more elaborations you have on that would be appreciated. Okay, uh, I guess uh, I, I called out the time on that one uh, in the cockpit. Uh, it, it, there was no doubt but what it was a slight pogo and uh, I think it uh, was longitudinal and as far as amplitude, I'm trying to think back to some of those pogo tests I wrote on the shake table, but uh, they were at such high level that I wouldn't, couldn't compare them to this. But uh, it was a pogo. Uh, it started just about that time because when, uh, when I felt it, I looked at the clock, and uh, it was not a... Uh, 14 Houston, we had an antenna change over here, and... Uh Fourteen Houston, how do you read? Fourteen Houston, how do you read? Come on, they were just talking about all important pogo oscillations. Okay, how do you read, Bruce? Uh, loud, clear, Stu. Uh, how do you read me? Oh, you're five square. The uh, statics died down, and as I was saying. Uh, there was no question but what it was a low uh, amplitude pogo starting right at uh, 8 plus 40. However, uh, the magnitude was low enough that it was not affected, uh, did not affect any of our voices. And, uh, you know, a fairly low level will we'll do that. So uh, I'd, I'd say, you know, it was, it was pretty small, uh, was not of any concern, but uh, picked it up just because, uh, you know, thinking about Pogo, I guess. <laughs> Roger, thank you. It's good to think about Pogo. It's fine. I mean, if they're going to ask questions about the launch vehicle. Yeah, did that last all the way until shutdown of the S2, or did it die back out? Bruce, I can't give you a positive answer. None of us can. Uh, my impression is it was there all the way, but... Uh, uh, that data really is a very good input. Okay, thank you. And I believe this concludes our discussion on the uh, booster questions. Okay. Uh, 14, this is Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Okay, just a little status on the probe situation. We have no further queries on the, the docking probe at this time. Uh, the conclusions of our ground analysis are that uh, the system is now working nominally, and our current intention is that you'll be go for the lunar landing and uh, all subsequent events. Uh, if we have any further well, commentary... Well, they're good. Go for lunar landing. Why, uh, we'll get back to you later on it. With respect to mid-course correction number two, we plan for that to take place at the nominal time, which is about uh, 30 hours, 36 minutes GET, and it'll be about 71 feet per second, which is also close to nominal. We are planning a, a GET update of uh, some 40 minutes uh, tomorrow at uh, the nominal time on the flight plan of about uh, 54.40, over. Okay, uh, we got that, Bruce, and... Uh are we going to leave this uh, uh, Earth dark side uh, dim light photography in? No, uh, that's affirmative. Okay. I am letting the altitude drift up as we get lighter, by the way. Uh, Houston, this is Al. I've changed the CCU head. Uh, how does this sound? Any better? Uh, can you give us a, a short count on that, Al? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. Go first. Roger, that sounds a lot better to me. Okay, 
This is Houston with the mid-course correction 2 pad, uh, SPS GNN burn, 64213, plus 102, minus 023, TIG, 030, 30701, minus 00259, plus 00044 plus 00664 roll 282 pitch 354-294-298-944-NA 252785390. The balance of the pad is NA. GDC align, Sirius and Rigel. Roll align, 230170002. No LH. In the burn attitude, S band high gain antenna pointing angles. Pitch, minus 2-2, two, two, yaw, zero. Wide beam, manual mode. Lemoid, 3-3, three, three, six, four, seven. Your burn time to the nearest tenth of a second is 10.3 seconds for use in uh, checking ball valve operation, over.
Uh, 14 Houston, uh, we've had a correction to the yaw angle for the S-band pointing. That should be plus 8 degrees, over. Uh, roger, the S-band pointing is pitch minus 22, yaw plus 8. Roger up. Roger, we have 14. Okay, and they were torqued at 29 plus 2, 0. Roger. This is Apollo Control at 29 hours, 23 minutes. Uh, during the past uh, uh, two hours or so uh, of this shift, uh, shortly after the maroon team of flight controllers came on, we began uh, uh, preparing for the uh, discussions on the probe and also for the uh, scheduled discussions on the booster performance during the powered uh, ascent during the uh, during the launch phase. Uh, during the discussions on the probe, uh, among the uh, comments that were made uh, by the crew, uh, Rusa noted that uh, there appeared to be no capture latches uh, activating until the uh, probe was retracted. Mm. He, he Campina Grande no is a little bit further to our right, primary. so I'll we turn away from the intended track so that we fly over it. Nitrogen pneumatic system which retracts the probe. Uh, Ed Mitchell summed up the uh, operation on the successful docking. Uh, as Mitchell described it, he said, Stu Rusa, who was at the controls of the spacecraft, moved in on the drogue said we started to bounce out, and at that point, uh, Rusa held plus X on the thrusters, um, moving the spacecraft into the center of the drogue, and said the vehicles began moving together as they activated the primary uh, switch, which uh, activates the pneumatic system that retracts the drogue, and at that point, uh, he said Al called out Barbara Pohl and Gray, and then we got hard docking. Uh, the talkback indicators that uh, Mitchell was referring to indicate initially that the probe is extended and the docking latches, the capture latches are caught. Uh, the second indication of Barbara Pohl uh, indicates that the capture latches have in fact captured and latched. And uh, finally, the third indication of gray uh, shows that the uh, main docking latch latches uh, have engaged and closed the hard docking latches. Uh, perhaps the uh, most significant... Uh, oh, I think I see the city the, of uh, Campina Grande up the ahead there. You see some buildings. Port from the crew that they noticed there is an airport a slight hum or buzz as Rusa described it during the translunar injection portion of the S4B burn uh, Rusa noted that this very low level hum or buzz which he said could be felt through the structure began about two minutes into the TLI burn uh, he also noted that uh, it was slight enough that uh, had the crew had their minds on other things, they probably would not have noticed it. Uh, Flight Director Milton Windler observed on the circuits here in the control center that uh, this is the sort of vibration or hum that has been reported also by previous crews and uh, there appeared to be uh, no particular concern over this. Uh, Russo also reported a slight pogo in the uh, second stage operation beginning at 8 minutes 40 seconds ground elapsed time. All right. Uh, he described it as Last a look at Campina Grande. Very light, very slight. And uh, one 
I expect the next thing we're going to be reaching is our destination. Similar vibrations the crew members have been subjected to on vibration tables. Uh, Russo noted that uh, with even a uh, relatively light... We're about 80% uh, of the flight in. Uh, on a, uh, ...in a simulated situation, it's difficult to talk. He said that uh, this was light enough that it did not affect their uh, voices in the spacecraft. The uh, Capcom also advised the crew that uh, at about 54 hours, uh, we will have the update to the ground elapsed time clocks in mission control and aboard the spacecraft. Uh, at this time, the GET clock, the clock that is currently reading GET uh, here in mission control, uh, will be updated. It will be moved ahead some 40 minutes. Uh, the clock that is currently designated TB5 will become the actual ground elapsed time. In other words, that clock uh, will display the true ground elapsed time, the total amount of time that has elapsed since liftoff. Uh, the clock, which is designated GET, uh, will retain that designation. The nomenclature will remain the same on that clock as it's displayed here in the control center. And the nomenclature on the clock, which will be displaying the actual GET, will remain TB5. Uh, to repeat that again, uh, recognizing that it's probably a bit confusing, the nomenclature on the clock will remain the same. However, what they're displaying will, will be changed. The clock that is designated GET uh, will actually be referred to here in the control center as the PET clock, the phase elapsed time clock. However, the nomenclature <laughs> on it... Why do they have to do things so complicated? It will, uh, it will remain fixed as the GET clock, and the nomenclature on the TB5 clock will also remain TB5. However, it will be counting actual ground elapsed time, the total time since liftoff. The rationale for the update to the clocks Please tell. is roughly as follows. Of course, launching 40 minutes late uh, without uh, changing the amount of energy that was put into the trajectory by the translunar injection maneuver with the Saturn third stage, we would have arrived at the moon 40 minutes late. Uh, however, the translunar coast phase is in many respects like a big sponge. Uh, squeeze things out of it or you can put things into it, use it to absorb uh, time differences. And in this case, with translunar injection, uh, the proper delta V, the proper velocity was added to put us uh, into lunar orbit at the same sun time or Greenwich mean time as the flight plan called for. The sun time on arrival then will be the same as it was originally planned to be in the flight plan and uh, mission events will occur in the same sequence after lunar orbit insertion as the flight plan called for. In order to make the flight plan agree with the sun time and the Greenwich mean time, it will be updated 40 minutes. Well, the clock will be moved ahead 40 minutes so that the phase elapsed time which is used as a reference to the flight plan, will agree with the flight plan. The alternative to this would be to update the flight plan by 40 minutes, making numerous changes to the flight plan uh, in, in pencil, both here on the ground and by the crew. Uh, to circumvent this problem, the clocks themselves will be changed, uh, recognizing that uh, the clocks are, in fact, uh, the, the GET clock is, in some senses, an arbitrary time reference, which allows us to reference time to the flight plan. Well, he did a good job explaining it. Uh, the crew uh, was advised this, uh, this event will occur at about 54 hours as uh, planned in the flight plan. So Recife will be our last stop in Brazil and we, then we're gonna go across the ocean in the Concorde and X-Plane 11 at the as the time, next Apollo flight. 14 is uh, traveling at a velocity of uh, 4536 feet per second 
and the spacecraft is 115,742 nautical miles from Earth. The uh, mid-course correction number two is scheduled to occur at 30 hours, 36 minutes, 7 seconds around elapsed time. The uh, velocity change in that maneuver, which will be performed with the spacecraft service propulsion system engine, will be 71.4 feet per second. And it will change the spacecraft approach to the moon, the point of closest approach from the current distance of about 2100 four nautical miles down to the planned 60 nautical mile uh, perigee or paraloon. The uh, burn will be a 10 second maneuver, a 10 second burn with the service propulsion system engine. Uh, the spacecraft at the time of the maneuver will be oriented uh, with its engine bell pointed in the direction of travel, uh, about 66 feet per second of the uh, burn will be in the direction pointing back to Earth, or in other words, it will be radial, a radial component, and 25 feet per second. Uh, Such details. Per second component, uh, which is retrograde, uh, or uh, in the easterly direction. The total composite delta V, as I said, will be 71.4 feet per second. It's At almost like he was anticipating that people would want to recreate in Kerbal Space Program or something. Apollo 14, this is you. Okay. At your convenience, we'd like to uh, pull and accept, and we'll uplink you a uh, new state vector, target load and the uh, PIPA and IRIC bias updates over. Just a reminder, PU is program 00, it's the idle program, so that they can change stuff in the computer. Okay, you have what you... Roger, they're on their way. And at the same time, <coughs> we'd like to uh, give you one minor flight plan update uh, due to your later liftoff time on uh, page 332. The flight plan, dark side dim light photography, we have a new value of longitude over two for you. Okay, go ahead. Roger. Old value is minus 42500. New value, minus 47500. Over. Okay, longitude over two is now minus 47500. Uh, Roger, and I've been asked to remind you that in connection with the mid-course burn number two, if there is stratification in the oxygen tanks, uh, you may get a uh, cryo low press light as this is reduced. Over. Uh, Roger. Fourteen Houston, your computer. Affirmative. Uh, how are you reading us now? We pass up computers, yours. Okay, we must have missed it during the and we're terminating here in a minute. Roger out. Yeah, that's a little bit too far south. I do want to fly over the city. The airport's on the south side of the city. And uh, that's an R2 that you're concerned about? Yeah, we've never seen uh, down 80 months ground off like that. 
Okay, we'll have an explanation for you in a second. Okay. Uh, Apollo 14, yes. Go ahead. Sir, uh, right here on your query on uh, noun 81. Uh, 4.3 is the number it was actually uplinked to the spacecraft. There is no problem involved with the spacecraft rounding off numbers or anything of that sort. The uh, maneuver that was passed to you on the maneuver pad was generated from uh, one computer reading a 4.35, which was rounded upwards by the flight of the 4.4. Uh, a separate computer processed the information leading to the automatic uplink and they rounded down to 4.3, over. Okay, those computers ought to talk to each other. <laughs> this is Apollo Control at 30 hours, 6 minutes. Apollo 14 at this time is uh, 117,213 nautical miles from Earth a spacecraft velocity 4,483 feet per second. About two hours ago, uh, an auspicious event slipped by unnoticed as the spacecraft passed the halfway mark in terms of total mileage, or in terms of uh, mileage to the moon, I guess we should say. Uh, at 27 hours, 4 minutes, 42 seconds, Apollo 14 was 109,172 nautical miles from Earth, or halfway between Earth and the Moon. Uh, the spacecraft velocity at that point was 4,779 feet per second. Uh, we'll cross the halfway point in time uh, on the trip to the Moon at 40 hours, 56 minutes. Uh, both the distance and the uh, time halfway point are dependent upon a normal mid-course correction too, uh, should that uh, MCC-2 maneuver, which is scheduled to be performed in a little less than 30 minutes, uh, give us different values, it would of course change the uh, uh, total distance uh, by some small amount. So there's receive. The flight dynamics officer has also uh, computed a uh, new set of coordinates and a new time for the arrival of the S-4B at the lunar surface. The uh, impact is scheduled to occur at a ground elapsed time of 82 hours, 38 minutes, 3 seconds, and our new set of coordinates are as follows. Uh, the latitude of the impact point uh, now appears to be at 9 degrees, 32 minutes south, the longitude 26 degrees, 20 minutes west. What we're seeing is a gradual shift of the uh, impact point slightly to the west and moving uh, a bit closer to the Apollo 12 uh, seismometer. Again, to repeat the uh, information on the scheduled mid-course correction, which is occurring at the second mid-course correction opportunity, it will be the first mid-course. Uh, the burn is scheduled to occur at 30 hours, 36 minutes, 7 seconds ground elapsed time. The burn duration will be 10 seconds. It will be performed with the service propulsion system engine, giving a total uh, velocity change of 71.4 feet per second. Uh, and the, the uh, bulk of that velocity change uh, will be in a radial direction or back towards Earth and the effect of the uh, maneuver will be to bulge the trajectory bulge the, tra the trajectory so that the uh, spacecraft arrives at the moon a little later and also at the planned uh, altitude of 60 nautical miles without the burn the spacecraft would pass by the moon at an altitude of 2104 nautical miles uh, and it would arrive 40 minutes uh, earlier uh, with the burn. It places the arrival time back 40 minutes uh, to coincide uh, with the 
I think this is the airport. Really dark. But okay. I mean, it's so dark it stands out. <laughs> All right. Taking into account the fact that uh, uh, we will be arriving at the moon at the uh, planned Greenwich Mean Time, we'll uh, depress the trajectory so that uh, the fly by the moon uh, prior to going into lunar orbit is at uh, 60 nautical miles. And we're now 25 minutes 54 seconds away uh, from that mid course correction maneuver. So the problem is this speedometer is not quite right. Distance well, at least it doesn't seem that way. By the moon. Uh, we'll also remove the spacecraft uh, from one free from a free re free return trajectory in at least one sense, and that is that uh, following the burn, it will no longer be possible to just double check uh, that. The, uh, Earth's atmosphere oh. and the proper entry corridor. Seems too uh, fast for the gear. RCS propulsion capabilities. Uh, once this mid-course correction has been performed in order to enter the uh, entry corridor properly, it will require either the uh, either subsequent mid-course corrections using the SPS engine or the uh, descent propulsion system engine on the lunar module. At uh, 30 hours... The there we go, wow. The Apollo control Needs 140 the knots for the landing gear, okay. The throttle produces quite a so lot of speed from the, uh, when the flaps and gear are retracted, but that, uh, it's uh, very it's sluggish once they're extended. And then uh, redo P40, you'll get better agreement with the pad values for attitude. Okay. This is Apollo Control at 30 hours 17 minutes. We now show the spacecraft to be in the proper attitude uh, for the mid course correction. I uh, would like to. Uh, uh, go back over one point that perhaps got a bit garbled in the last report, and that is the effects of this uh, maneuver on the trajectory. Uh, without the burn, without the mid-course correction, uh, the spacecraft, as we said, would pass about 2,104 nautical miles from the moon. Uh, also, its time of closest approach would be about 15 minutes later than desired. Uh, with the mid-course correction, we place the time of approach we, at, at the time desired, uh, which is 82 hours, 0 minutes, 37 seconds. That would be the time of closest approach with no further maneuvers. Uh, and we lower the point of closest approach from the 2,104 nautical miles to 60. All right, looking good so far. Miles. We're now about 17 minutes, 30 seconds away uh, from that mid-course correction maneuver. Hmm. Oh, 14, this is Houston. Go ahead, Houston. All right, you can go ahead and terminate uh, charging on battery alpha at this time. Okay. Roger, your go. Roger. This is Apollo Control at 30 hours, 35 minutes. Flight Director Milton Wendler has just uh, uh, reminded his flight controllers that we're one minute away now from okay. our first mid-course correction. Oop. Is it down or is it not down? Uh, Jeez. I think it's down. About 40, 
five seconds. Whoa, it's squirrely. Flight controllers here are monitoring their data, and uh, we'll be observing the performance of the service. Oh, we were just on the main wheels. And spacecraft systems during the uh, uh, okay. period of this burn. Uh, total burn duration again is uh, planned to be about 10.3 seconds. It'll give us uh, a change in velocity of 71.4. Uh, which side do I want to go? Uh, there's stuff on both sides. Okay. Okay. Coming up on 10 Let's seconds. go this way. And we show ignition. Oh. Is that... Is that... A cauldron? That'd be appropriate, because this is a blue mesh plane. Ah, uh, I didn't okay. park it very well, though. Officer reports all pressures in the engine look normal. But yeah, uh, I have the cauldron Rafali. And that's also by blue mesh, I believe. So that's sort of appropriate. Oh no, there's no way flying this, it's a and ghost we, plane. Uh, show the burn has been uh, shut down. Uh, we'll stand by for... Uh, an assessment of the uh, maneuver. Uh, that was a mighty good burn there, the residuals, uh, be no trim required. Okay, I'll pause it right there as they did their correction burn and everything is okay. And they continue on their trip to the moon. So this has been the flight in the Alpha Jet from Fortaleza to Recife. And next time it will be the Concorde in x 11 going across the Atlantic. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.